Hey friends, welcome back to the 911 Strong Podcast. With me as always is my co-host, Kristen Hodegy. Hello, hello. Hey, welcome back. Thanks. We got a fun back. episode today, don't we? we? We do. We had a very good time talking with our very special guest, Michael Crow. Mike Crow is uh, one of America's first amputee cops, and he's a full-time police officer, mm -hmm. and he's an amputee below his, or at his foot, mm -hmm. but he does a very effective job, and uh, so much so that there's this viral video going around right now. Did you see that one? I did. It's a good one. Yeah, it's a good one. We're mm -hmm. going to talk about that and a lot more as we come back with Michael Crow. Station to all units. Prepare to copy. You're listening to the 911 Strong Podcast. Don't act like I never told you. With Aram and Kristen, bringing you stimulating discussion. No, I like the sound of that. An entertaining conversation. And now, here's Kristen and Aram. Great. Hey guys, welcome back to the 911 Strong Podcast. We're here with our special guest, Michael Crow, internet sensation, and uh, hey, just recently a, a new viral star again. Welcome to the show, Mike. Hi. Thank you, guys. Hi, really appreciate you guys having me on the show. Yeah, thanks for uh, joining us. We, uh, you and I, have been um, friends for a long time on social media. Uh, every time we've had an occasion to try to meet up, we we miss each other. But uh, we have a really interesting relationship. Mike is the only guy I've ever sent. Uh, a flamingo selfie too. Do you know what so that is? So you're flamingo friends? Yeah, we're flamingo friends. We we both happen to have flamingo floaties and we both had pools. So hmm. we just did one of those who did it better things. And if you've ever seen Mike's flamingo physique, you know who won. pool selfie yeah. comparison. Yeah, it's what guys do. Okay. Yeah, I think it, yeah, it started out like as a, just a summer gig or something. And next thing I know, you're trying to one up me with the, uh, the flamingo and, <laughs> and who could do the better relaxing in the pool. And yeah, next thing you know, it's just a contest back and forth. So yeah, um, you I, know, we, we all know who has the better physique and I, I was just doing it to, <laughs> but who has the better flamingo floaty? <laughs> I think Mike won there also. <laughs> Well, speaking yeah. of physique, you know, uh, there's, believe it or not, there might be one or two people out there that don't know who you are, um, but you've made a name for yourself in the law enforcement community uh, and in mainstream media as well as social media for being uh, one of the first um, amputee police officers. And um, you want to tell us a little bit about um, how that came about, your, your journey, and uh, I think we lost you there for a minute. Still there, Mike? Oh having some technical difficulties. Well, while we try there to get out. Oh, there you are. There we go. Oh, there, there we go. go. All right. These All right. long distance so relationships. So what, what, what I was saying is um, you, you've made a name for yourself uh, nationally on the national stage for being one of the first amputee police officers. You want to tell us a little bit about your journey there? Yeah, so I'm definitely not the first, and I certainly hope that I am not the last, you know, amputee uh, police officer. There is actually, I want to say, more than maybe 50 or 60 people around the country and wow. also around the world that are also um, amputees, and they put on the badge and gun, and they go out there and uh, serve their community. So um, I just like to think that I'm just one of those, you know, guys that goes out there and is able to, to do that. Um, my story kind of started, uh, back in 2012, uh, just graduated, uh, the police Academy. And just before that, I just graduated college, um, an alumni of the university of Arizona in Tucson, um, got my degree, came back and literally just finished the police Academy. And I got into a motorcycle accident and I was less than 24 hours uh, from starting my first, uh, job out in the streets, wow. uh, my first out there in patrol. And girl texting and driving came up and T-boned me um, mm -hmm. on my motorcycle. And I'd spent about two weeks in the hospital. Um, during that time, had about 11 surgeries. And I remember the doctor coming in and saying, hey, you got about a 50% chance of being able to walk again. We can save your leg, uh, but you probably wouldn't be able to do your normal uh, daily functions. And you probably would never be able to be a police officer. Um, or we can fit you with a prosthetic. And at the time, just... I flipped a coin. I was a quarter uh, right there in my next to me at the bed and, and landed on tails. So I told the doctor, yep, I'm going to amputate. So wow. and wow. the story was written from there. And um, it took me about six months of um, therapy. So six months from my accident to the actual time I went back to work and started working as a police officer. Um, yeah, it just took me six months to repeat my, 
kind of repeating myself there, but uh, yeah, it only took me about six months to recover. Yeah. And so I was able to get back and I've been a police officer since for about seven years now. Yeah. You said that decision was made by a flip of a coin, uh, but did you always know that no matter what the outcome of the surgery was that you were still going to pursue law enforcement? Um, so after the accident, they were able, actually able to like save my leg. So I had my foot reattached um, to me. And when you're sitting there in the hospital trying to make that decision, you're sitting there like, well, I want to do anything I can to actually save the foot. No way am I trying to amputate. Um, but when the doctors start laying out your, your possibilities and your options for later on, um, and they say, hey, you got a 50% chance, um, at, at what point, you know, what, what do you do? You can't, you know, you can consult so many doctors, you can talk to so many people. And that's when I just finally said, you know what, I'm going to leave it to fate. And I flipped the coin and, you know, I landed on tails and I like to think that, you know, I, I'm, I'm always going to step, you know, stay behind that decision. I'm a flipping the coin and I think it turned out to be a good one. Yeah, I'd say so. I think what you did uh, resonated amongst everybody, not just the amputee community, uh, community but those that are considering law enforcement that might have other physical limitations. Um, you know, we just before the show, during our pre-show, we talked about those that might have physical limitations because they're overweight or they're not in shape. Um, have you gotten feedback from the, from others about what kind of motivation you are to them? Yeah, I, I constantly get, you know, messages, um, emails from people that are, you know, trying to seek help or they just need that little extra motivation or they're just, you know, not sure if they want to get into it because they are overweight or if they do have a disability and they think it's going to prevent them from, um, you know, doing the job or getting into a career with law enforcement. And so, um, you know, I normally tell them it's like, you know, you may not be able to do it. I'm not, I'm going to be real frank with you, but um, what you got nothing to lose. If you have to lose the 10, 15 pounds or whatever to get in there, you know, and you don't make it, guess what? You just completed your goal of losing 15, 20 pounds, and now you can go and do something else. You know, if you have a disability and then you get to the very end of it and you say, I'm sorry, we can't take you. You can't be a part of this, you know, um, this department. Guess what? Go apply for another department or go do something else related to law enforcement. Um, and you just prove to yourself right there that you can change, you can adapt, and you can overcome anything you can. It may not be that goal of law enforcement, but you can go and do something else, you know, related to it or in a completely different field. And so you almost have that self-assurance that says like, you know what? I went for it. I tried, you know, and guess what? I came out a better person because now I have all these other options that I can choose from. So that's kind of the main message that I give to these guys. Um, and then if they're able to do it, I, I try to stick with them as much as I can and try to help them in any any possible way with small details um, to try to help further their career. That's awesome. So uh, have people actually reached out to you and, and you've developed a, a dialogue with them and you, you actually do follow up with them? Yeah. So actually there was a guy um, in uh, San Bernardino um, with the sheriff's department and he had a very similar uh, situation when she was in a motorcycle accident. Um, I think he was on his way to work. Um, and he was already, um, um, I believe it's the sheriff's, um, San Bernardino County Sheriff. Am I, mm -hmm. am I saying that correctly? Mm -hmm. um, a lot of so audience he, members that listen from that department. Okay, yeah. excellent. Um, so I was able to actually see him in the hospital. And then I met up with him several times afterwards. And he actually recovered, recovered, ugh, recovered quicker than I did. Um, oh. He was able to get out, I think, in four months, wow. which, which is absolutely amazing. And there's another guy in uh, North Carolina. He was a, a state trooper, I believe. Um, and we've stayed in, in contact and kind of, I think he's, uh, was able to promote and is a detective now. Um, so a couple of these guys I get to meet with, I talk with, I FaceTime with them, FaceTime with them for hours upon hours and making sure that every detail is covered. So they're able to get out there and uh, go back to work. Yeah. That's I, great. Yeah. I think it's, it's totally motivating. And when you talk to a guy like Mike, uh, and, and you talk to him with whatever little problems you have, um, it's hard to, 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 to take what Mike's story is and, and try to compare to that. And you have no excuses, essentially. Yeah, I think it's very humbling and puts everything into perspective, too, you know. Yeah. And, and guess what? I'm, you know, I just, I'm missing a right foot. There's other guys that are missing, you know, above the knee. They're missing all the way up to their hip. So I don't have an excuse. I yeah. literally do not have an excuse to say, no, I'm going to sit on the couch and I'm not going to do anything. No, I'm not going to go out there and try for my department. I'm not going to go and try and get that special assignment. You know, yeah. I, I don't have an excuse. So it's like, it's 
you know, it doesn't necessarily stop with me. There's other guys that are kicking ass, taking names, and they are far worse than I am. And guess what? They do it every day with a smile on their face. So I don't have an excuse Amen. to fall back on. Yeah, you and I have something in common, Mike. Uh, you lost a foot. And I'm pretty sure somewhere along the way I did too, because I, I think I was supposed to be six foot eight. I'm five eight. Uh, I, 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 that, that extra foot that is was horrible. <laughs> I see what you did there. I like it. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Hey, so, so being a police officer in California, um, we'll, we'll get to some of your most recent experiences later. But aside from being a scary job, um, I, think, I think you had a very scary experience uh, a little while back that was televised on national TV, right? What show was I, it? I, oh, that's right. It was that dating show, right? The Proposal? I was on that ABC. Oh, I'm so glad you guys brought that up, man. I, I, I totally had that behind me and I was moving on. And then it's like, oh, yeah, for, for the, let, me, let, me, okay. let me set it up. I'm sorry. It, might, it, it, it is, it is brutal because uh, I think you were the first episode, right? On, on that uh, the season premiere of the proposal. The premise of the proposal is so Mike's, the, Mike's the stud, Mike's the subject. And these women, yeah. I think it's a dozen women uh, all are vying to get Mike's attention. And they, they go through like this What a question. horrible experience for you. <laughs> like, <laughs> sounds terrible the way you're reliving it now, yes. Well, well, at the, at the end, they take a big risk. Uh, yeah. And Mike, if he finds someone that he thinks he has the potential of pursuing marriage with, he actually proposes on national TV. OMG. Yeah, that's what I said. And that's what, wow. that was my first experience uh, actually watching Mike. And I, I found him on, on Instagram and I followed him oh, right away. Oh, so you stalked him. I, was yeah. this before or after the Flamingo picks? Before. Oh, so it evolved. Yeah. But, okay. but yeah, uh, <laughs> what looked like it was going to be a happy story, uh -huh. um, unfortunately, it wasn't. Um, but, you know, that's so hard. It, it's, a, you're, it's a coin flip there too, right? I mean, it seems to be a, a theme, um, but you're essentially taking a risk there. Absolutely. I think the uh, percentages are a lot lower than a coin flip of 50%. And I'd like <laughs> to think it's maybe one or in a thousand, maybe one yeah. in 2000 that, right. you know, everything works out. But it was just one of those things where um, they reached out to me um, and they said, Hey, would you like to be a part of this show? And it was part of, you know, ABC, The Bachelor, and it was going to air right after The Bachelor. It's a brand new concept. And I said, Hey, why not? I'll go and I'll try it out. And um, next thing you know, I keep getting pushed through, pushed through, pushed through. And then they said, Hey, would we like to make you the main guy? Would you like to be the main guy? And I said, yeah, great. And so I remember I had to go to my department, had to get everything all signed off because I was going to go uh, be on a leave of absence for a few days. And, um, what can I say? It was one heck of an experience. It was terrifying. It was scary. It was, I can't believe I'm in this situation. I can't believe that, I'm going to be on national television and I kind of want to, I always go back to this and telling my family, my family had no idea I was going to be on that TV show. So I always go and I, they producers reached out to me real quick and they said, Hey, would you like to be on this uh, bachelor type show? I turned to my parents. I go, Hey, um, the bachelor reached out to me. Would you, um, would you care if I went on that show or if I was involved in it? And my mom was says, hell no. No, 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 no. She knowed me out of the house. We had family dinner that <laughs> Sunday. I got knowed out of the house. That was the only thing I heard. So um, I was like, you know what? I'm just going to go for it. I'm going to see what's going to happen. And so I secretly did everything behind their back. I didn't tell anybody. Wow. And when we started the filming, I told them, I was like, yeah, I'm going to be in LA for uh, training. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to be gone for a couple of days. Can you watch my dog and stuff? And they go, okay, yeah, sure. No problem. It was during the NBA finals because that's when they started the promo for it. I was sitting there and uh, with my family and they did a, um, a promo for it. And I turned to my mom and I go, you know, that's, that's your son that's on television. She goes, what? Like, yeah, that guy right there. That's yeah. me. Oh, she didn't you, know. were you were hidden. I hid. I, I was hidden. Yeah. So right. even the people had no idea it was me. Right. And so I told my mom that and she goes, no. This, this whole time, like you've been going behind my back and I go, uh, sorry, you know, <laughs> and it turned into, um, uh, she goes, goes, okay, all right, that makes sense. And then she had 15 of her girlfriends come over and then they had a viewing party at their house. So <laughs> they got, they got over it real quick, but it was, I always tell that story because I didn't let anybody know. I didn't, cause I was scared, you know, I was nervous and stuff like that. And 
they asked me if I wanted in my family on the show and I said, Nope, Nope. Just have friends. That's it. Right. So, and then, yeah, so I kept it from them. No one knew it was a complete secret. Wow. That's crazy. Total, total, I couldn't do it. I mean, I, mean, I can't cause I'm married, but, um, but maybe <laughs> yeah. I, can. I don't know. Things, just, things, shouldn't happen. things shouldn't happen. But yeah, I mean, it's good to do stuff outside of your comfort zone and to experiment and, you know, push yourself forward and everything. Yeah. Mike, certainly the you never know. That. So, yeah. okay. So fast forward because now people are going to wonder, are you single or are you not single? I am not single. I am taken. Oh, sorry, Heart, Kristen. Hearts are breaking. Well, I'm married too. So yeah. that yeah. ship. I, like, I think too, too married. Yeah. Okay. So yes, I'm, <laughs> I am, I am happily taken right now. Well, that's good. Well, uh, and I, I know who you're taken by and, uh, I don't know if it's, it's okay to bring her up or not. Yeah, yeah. Her oh, yeah. name is uh, Angela. Who yeah. lives here in the uh, yeah in Phoenix. And Angela is a badass. She's a, a military pilot, and she was a military oh, pilot. That's and awesome. Now, and now she flies planes for a living, and uh, she, she's a badass. She's on Instagram too. Oh, if people nice. wanted to follow her, how can they find her? Uh, that pilot Angela. That right. dot pilot dot Angela. And, right. Uh, yeah. So she's a uh, commercial helicopter pilot here in uh, Phoenix. She just started that job, that position. Um, but yeah, so if she, if you guys need helicopter lessons or if you're trying to get your license, then she, uh, she's the one doing that. So yeah, right. she is a complete 100% badass. Yeah. She is amazing. Awesome. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, nothing but love for our service members. We have a number of yeah. people that uh, are veterans and, and current service members that listen to our podcast. Um, but going back to the proposal, um, after that experience, how, has it made an impact on you? Did it change your life? Uh, because I'm sure you got a lot of attention because of it. Yeah. So everything kind of overnight completely uh, blew up. And as far as, you know, my Instagram, my page and everything just completely just went, I wouldn't say international, you know, just went huge. And obviously you get, I think you guys both understand being officers, you're going to get that negative attention. And so obviously when you're out there on the streets, you're used to, you know, people calling you bad names, used to people you know, um, mother effing you and stuff like that. So for me, it, it was okay. Like I understood it. And cause I knew I was going to get both sides of it. Um, the part, the, the other girl that I was dating at the time, um, couldn't really grasp that or handle right. that. And so there was, that was caused a little bit of a drift, um, in between while we were doing all that stuff. Um, but you know, for me, it's just like, Hey, this is normal. This is life. You know, I have thick skin. This is, and that, that kind of helped me prepare um, for everything that's going on now and, you know, leading up to this point. So, uh, but yeah, everything 100% changed, everything flipped. And I, I can't say I'm more blessed because now I have a little bit of a platform to kind of show other people about uh, being an amputee and overcoming um, any obstacles, um, you know, to persevere and do well. So. Yeah. I mean, you certainly are a motivation in, in many aspects. And, um, and if you don't know, Mike, uh, Mike has an incredible physique. He shows his workout videos. <laughs> he inspired tons to do pushups. I, Mike started doing pushups on his stories. Uh -huh. The next thing you know, he's got this. It's like a big old pushup following. Yeah. Everybody's That's sharing cool. videos of them doing pushups. But what is interesting is after he do his pushups, uh -huh. he would grab Reese's peanut butter cups. Uh. <laughs> right. I'm, I'm surprised they haven't sponsored you yet. I, I don't know if, and hopefully with this platform, someone can reach out to me because I would absolutely love it. Um, you know, obviously Reese's doesn't need any more sponsorships or anything like that or any type of like, you know, bigger notoriety, but man, I would literally do anything to be sponsored by Reese's. Right. I, I have the biggest bag. I'm always going to Costco, getting the you know, 200 pound. Like I absolutely love it. You know, I, I put it in my milkshakes. I put it in my protein wow. powders. You know, when I'm having a bad day, you know, I put a little bit in my hair and stuff like that just to get through it. It's, it's just amazing. You well, know? It's, so, it's obviously the secret to your physique, too, I, right? I guess that works for you. I wish it worked you for know? me. I know. I, I work out to eat Reese's. That's right. <laughs> Have you ever had – I do this when we go camping. Uh, you're familiar with s'mores? I replaced oh, – I'm, I'm American, yes. I'm yeah, American. so I replaced the, <laughs> I replaced the uh, chocolate, the chocolate. bar with, with a Reese's peanut butter cup. So much better. Hold on. And then I put a, slice, a banana slice, Reese's peanut butter cup, banana slice, marshmallow, and graham crackers. Try it. He's a hot mess after he eats it, though. Oh, yeah. I'm in a coma. <laughs> <laughs> the, the glycogenic spice. It's so, so good. Wow. My mind is blown. Uh, thank you. 
Thank you. Thank yeah, you. It'll, it'll knock you up. It'll, it'll knock you on your butt. <laughs> Speaking Chocolate of being wasted. knocked on your butt, <laughs> yeah. what a segue! I love right? it. Yes. What a segue. That signs means we're professionals here. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, no one could deny uh, your most recent video was um, was viral for a reason. People, everybody I know shared it. Uh, everybody I, that I've spoken to about it. Was, were, was highly impressed at what happened. And um, so, so you want to set it up? Yeah, to, to kind of set it up, it, you know, everyone gets these kind of like unknown situations in which you got a frantic person on the other line just saying, hey, there's this guy, um, you know, terrorizing my store. And at the, at the moment, there was like a language barrier between the, the RP and our dispatch. And um, I remember being maybe a couple minutes down the road, so I was able to arrive on the scene first. But um, like normal, you kind of, you look out and you look around the corner to see what you're dealing with. And the guy was on the ground like a cat going after one of the posters up on the convenience store wow. and, and you know, okay, oh, this is nice. not going to turn out well. And he actually saw me kind of peeking my head around. Um, so that's when I approached him and you guys see that in the video and that's where it kind of, it picks up from there. Um, just think of a guy on, on, some type of drugs. And I didn't know at the time what type of drugs he was on, but, um, you know, giving them the verbal commands, Hey, you're on the ground. All right. Stay seated where you are. And you know, you're not getting up, not doing this stuff. And what people don't understand from that angle. And it was kind of in the corner of the shop, there was actually more distance between myself and that suspect. But, um, you know, people can say, Hey, why didn't you have more distance? Why didn't you, you know, break right. it up? If you guy, if you knew the guy was on drugs or doing whatever, but, um, so anyways, you know, I, gave him the commands he didn't listen and then he got within my my 10 foot or my 12 foot range and that's when you know i deployed the taser and deploying the taser i i saw both darts go one just below his um you know the nipple or the boob area and then the other one was near the hip and i saw him and he literally looked down at the darts and then looked back at me and just uh you know and started mother effing me oh, and i looked wow. down i go Oh, shit. <laughs> what am I going to do? You know, right. and that's when, you know, I said, all right, we're going hands on. And it was just like yeah. that. I made that decision. And so I took a couple steps back because I knew I, I had to put a little more into it with him being a bigger guy. And what you don't see, or actually, if you would slow down the video, is him throwing the first punch. Mm -hmm. So he actually winds up and right. tries to punch me first. In which, you know, I was able to move back my head and then that actually got me in position to where, you know, I, I make the, the money shot or the connection, you know, the connect with um, his face. And it was just a one shot, you know, it got him down on the ground and I noticed that that was effective. And what's the first thing you do once you get a guy on the ground or you have the upper, you know, what do you call it, the, the dominance over him is, hey, he's got his hands behind his back because, yeah. you know, we got to get him in handcuffs. So that's going to give us the uh, ultimate leverage. So that's exactly what I did. Um, and what you don't see after the video is there was actually two guys driving down the street and they got out of their car, you know, and the first thing was, dude, I just saw that punch, you know? And I was just like, Hey, uh, can you guys help me real fast with his feet? Cause he was starting to wake up and go a little crazy. So it actually helped me take him wow. into custody oh, that's good. Um, there. So then, and then they just got in their car and drove off. But I'll never forget that look is you deploy that taser and you know, 50% of the time it works all the time, you know, that percentage there and you deploy that taser and to see his face kind of look down and then look back up and you just like, Oh boy, we're, yeah. we're missing with somebody a lot different here. Yeah. And yeah. But luckily everything turned out the way it did. And um, yeah, it wasn't until we got to the hospital and he goes, yeah, I, I took some PCP. I took some, you know, cocaine and stuff like that. And um, he actually didn't remember anything. Sure. He was 100% fine, didn't have any injuries at the hospital, um, and then he was able to get uh, booked into the jail. So, right. Yeah, that's um, interesting you say, you bring that up, um, uh, that you qualified the distance, because I'm sure that was one of the critiques that you got was you were too close, and all these internet experts out there say, ah, mm -hmm. oh, the darts didn't have enough of a spread, but you can't argue that it's the trajectory, if the evidence was there, if you have one that's at the nipple line and one at the hip, that can't occur if you're within a foot or Too two. Close, you have to yeah. be at that distance. So the evidence was there that you had the appropriate distance. And you're right. One of the things that I did notice was he was mid swing uh, when you were able to clock him right on the, on the chin. And um, that's interesting to know, cause I've never been able, I've, 
I've only dealt with someone on PCP once in my career, but I've never been, uh, I didn't know until seeing your video that um, the vein, the nerve that hits the, ch that's along the chin that knocks people out would still be effective. And in your case, it was effective. Yeah. And yeah, I guess getting back to that spread, you know, I, I don't have my use of force photos where I can show you because, sure. you know, when you deploy the taser, obviously they have to take the diagnostics of everything. Right. And mm -hmm. then obviously you have to take, you know, pictures of, you know, your use of force and I can show you guys where exactly the, uh, the darts entered. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, honestly, you, I, you, up a, you make a good point in which, you know, talking about that, is it the vein that comes up um, underneath the chin? I'm not thinking about that. Right. During, during the fight, you're literally not thinking about it. You're just thinking of a way to get this guy on the ground and to get him into custody and, you know, referring back to your training. And, you know, unfortunately, I had to use a brawl tactic yeah. in that case. Yeah. You know, I didn't feel as confident to do some type of um, takedown where if I was going to shoot for his legs, um, you know, it was just one of those things where it goes, hey, I'm going to choose to, you know, clock this guy in the face and, you know, hopefully it works. And then I will reassess and then go on to my right. next tactic. So yeah. that's just kind of what happened. Yeah, and that's the thing. A lot of people that don't wear our boots, um, they don't know, is you have to a split second to make that determination. You, you've got to assess, and a lot of people think we're robots, and you know, behind our eyes, we see the computer that gives us his size, height, weight, yeah. none of that stuff. You're sizing him up, you're making estimations, and you're making a decision based on your prior experiences and training, like you said. So yeah. that, it was a very uh, dramatic video, and um, I think a lot of people um, – learned a lot from that a lot of at least i did um i saw what was effective and what worked and um uh you know I, you're a big guy yourself uh the guy looked like he was just as big really big yeah yeah he was he was a bigger guy too he was about yeah i was uh, six one and then yeah he was just north of uh, about 250 um when they obviously have to take all that stuff when they get to the hospital mm -hmm. um but yeah and and getting back to those tactics it's you know and i think this is the beauty and the curse of law enforcement a beautiful tactic or a beautiful takedown that some guy used, you know, five days earlier with a, with a subject or with an arrestee is not going to work for the next situation. Right. We have these structured, you know, takedowns. We have these um, things that we can try, but there is no perfect scenario. There is no perfect um, thing to take somebody into the custody. And so, um, you know, mine just worked for that situation and for my uh, scenario, but guess what? If I do it with somebody else, it, it may not work, you know, and we're maybe talking about a guy mounting me or something like that. And, you know, you know, roughing me up a little bit because the thing that I decided didn't necessarily work, you know, would I reassess and do something different? Absolutely. Um, but maybe that doesn't work on the next guy. Right. Well, we're certainly glad that it worked out in your favor. Uh, you know, we care about your safety out there and, we care about all the other officers safety out there. And I think the lessons that uh, you provide here are very important because it tells people you can't rely on one thing. You right. constantly hear people say, I train Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. Well, that's great if it goes to the ground, right? But what about striking? Mm -hmm. And it's, it shows here that sometimes it that's doesn't even have to get it. to that level, right? You have yeah. to have, diversify your training mm -hmm. and be able to reach for what's going to be appropriate for that matter. Would you yeah. agree with that? Absolutely. And, you know, I, th I think it's important that those guys train the, as a BJJ. Um, and, you know, if it's any type of karate, if it's doing just literally anything else, I think that's absolutely prudent. And I think it's necessary for your training. Um, but yeah, there is no one stop shop. And, you know, man, if I use that, you know, over under takedown or something like that, you know, right. reverse throw, that would have been absolutely perfect. And he would have been in handcuffs before he even got to the ground. You know, it just this doesn't work out that way. And, um, but you know, having these Monday, Monday morning quarterbacking and stuff is I, in my opinion, I, I think it's necessary and I think it's good to go, you know, through these type of videos and make sure, Hey, would this work or would this, you know, this other situation work? So, um, I think it's necessary, but then you run into the, the keyboard warriors and sure. Yeah. So, yeah, and, and but, that's the risk you get by putting yourself out there on social media. And I, I think a lot of people in our positions don't realize that, that, a lot of people think that we do this uh, as a self-serving mechanism, right. but it's so much more beyond that. And they don't yeah. understand until they've been in our shoes that we do this for right. the profession. Yes. And yes, yeah, some of it is uh, we do get benefits from it. Absolutely. But for the most part, we wouldn't be sticking out our necks mm -hmm. uh, if it wasn't bigger than ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's just a yeah, good we reminder too, for like some of the younger guys coming in thinking like, 
oh, I've got all this equipment, it's gonna work. Well, no, it's not always gonna work. Even if you make contact correctly like you did, depending on what they're on, it's not gonna have an effect. And then what, you're gonna rely on your back? Well, you, you never know, some people's backs are like 30 minutes away. Right. So you better have some endurance and some plan B. Absolutely. Know? Yeah. And you know, it's, it's, it's very tough watching these other videos that are being broadcasted and they're putting out there. And I, I really don't know. And I, I can't really, you know, attest to, you know, why they're doing what they're doing, but um, some of the stuff is very head scratching. And I think there was the, the female officer recently, she had her taser out and she was trying to go around and dry stun um, the entire time. And, you know, I, you know, it's very interesting and I, I'd love to dissect it and see actually what's going on in her mind. And I think this is good that we were able to talk about it. And I'm telling you exactly, mm -hmm. this is going through my mind as I'm approaching. If it gets to this point, if it gets to this point, I'm going to do this, this, and this, um, you know, and to obviously help the next officer, you know, to, to pre-plan before they get into a situation like that. Um, so it'd also be great to run into, you know, that officer or at least, Oops. um, there you go. Damn it. We try. Okay. I tried. I tried to do the do not disturb, but I knew this was going to happen, but um, okay. it would, it would be cool to, you know, get their, get their head or um, kind of what was going through their minds when they were uh, kind of doing that kind of stuff to, you know, help the next officer. Yeah, you're absolutely right. It's easy to critique and point the finger, uh, but it's much more difficult to try to break it down and make something constructive out of it. So credit to all those people out there that actually, use videos like that for educational yeah. purposes. And you never know what was going through that, that one uh, female officer's mind or any officer that goes through a use of force that's highly critiqued. Um, yeah. But hey, uh, Mike, we thank you so much for your time. Uh, you, you made this interview so easy because I, I think just because we spoke before, but um, you know, I learned, I learned a couple of <laughs> things about you that I didn't know. And uh, I hope our audience members uh, did the same as well. If they wanted to learn more about you and follow you, where can they find you? Um, they can follow me on my Instagram. It's a uh, Crobo cop. I think it's C R O W E underscore B O cop. And I think you guys can tie the connection there as far yeah, as with the, the robo cop there. But um, <laughs> um, I will definitely be adding more. Um, I did some other stories as far as my background and my physical therapy and kind of getting into the six months leading into me getting back to work. So I'll be adding some more videos like that. So literally if anybody is there has questions about, you know, amputees in law enforcement, or like we talked about earlier, um, maybe struggling with something and they're not sure if they actually want to get into that profession, please send me a message, um, shoot me an email and I'll be sure to get back to you as soon as I can. I do apologize if I don't get back to you within the next couple of days. But, you know, I do have a life and I'm, I'm trying to, you know, pursue other things here. So, but please shoot me a message and I will get back to you. Awesome. That's awesome. Thank you. Well, thanks, Mike. We certainly wish you the best of luck in your future endeavors and uh, we appreciate having you on the show. Yeah, thank you so much. It was great. Very easy going. Look, we, we froze him. We did freeze him. <laughs> are we having some technical difficulties? <laughs> that is awesome. Oh, there you are. There, there you are. You're, yeah, you're, I'm back. We finally made this happen. So yes, I, I am honored. So thank you guys. I appreciate it. All right. Thanks for your time. Thank you. We'll talk to you later. All right. All right bye. bye. You've been listening to the 911 Strong Podcast with Aram and Kristen. You can subscribe to the 911 Strong Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, Stitcher, and many other fine podcast platforms. You can also see the in-studio recording on YouTube. Just search 911 Strong. We value your opinion. Please leave us a review, and we would really appreciate a five-star rating. Thank you for listening, and don't forget to tell your friends about us.